Hi, I'm Mike Coyle, and you're watching Inside Exploration. Today, I'm here with a special guest in Jim Renault. He is the owner of Renault Geological Consulting, and he's been working for RJK Explorations in plotting their indicator minerals, uh, where RJK has been exploring for the source of the 800 karat Nipissing Diamond. Jim, thanks so much for taking the time to go over this with us and explain how this process works. Hey, hi, Mike. Thanks very much for having me, and uh, look forward to talking about this. Yeah, so before we get started in the interview, why don't you go ahead and tell us a little bit about yourself and what you do and how you came to start working with RJK Exploration. Sure. So uh, my name is uh, Dr. Jim Renault. I'm president and director of Renault Geological Consulting. I'm a graduate of Western University. In 2005, I founded Renault Geological Consulting with my wife, uh, Natalie, who's also a geologist. At that time, we purchased um, an electron microprobe from Caltech University, which sits behind me, and entered into the exploration world by analyzing diamond indicator minerals. Over the years, we expanded our business into other areas, including field programs and uh, worked on a diverse range of deposit types from precious and base metals to um, uranium, uh, iron ore, and rare earth elements. However, a large percentage of our lab business for well over 15 years has been analyzing diamond indicator minerals. I've also done many related petrographic um, uh, rock studies for mostly junior companies and for many that have gone on to become developed mines. So looking back, I've analyzed probably tens of thousands of indicator minerals. And to this day, we continue to work with junior exploration companies and prospectors uh, supporting their exploration programs. Excellent. So you're going to give us a little bit of a presentation here and show us what it is that you do um, on a day to day. Um, so we're, I'm just going to go ahead and let you go share your screen and give that presentation and kind of explain to people your process. All right. So uh, the mineral chemical data provided to me by um, RJK, uh, the mineral chemistry was done by uh, CFM Minerals out west. And um, RJK has asked me to present the data on the various uh, diamond, uh, diamond plots uh, to characterize the different uh, indicator minerals. So we'll start with the garnet plots and um, I'll begin with the calcium versus chrome plot. And then we'll look at the calcium versus titanium and the calcium versus sodium. So this here is an all encompassing uh, graph of all the data points uh, from RJK, from their various uh, sample sites here. Um, what I want to do is just kind of go through this diagram and explain what the different fields mean. Um, so we'll start uh, with the axes. So calcium and weight percent is plotted on the X and chrome uh, CR203 weight percent is plotted on the Y axis. This line here, um, is called the G9, G10 divide. Um, it intersects the X axis at about 3.3 weight percent uh, CAO. And this line represents the calcium saturation characteristics of Harzbergitic and uh, Lerzolitic rocks. Um, the G9 field um, contains uh, chrome pyropes uh, derived from uh, Lerzolitic mantle and they are the most um, abundant garnet type um, recovered in exploration programs. Um, and then the G10 are Harzbergitic and Gurney uh, correlated that 85% of uh, prototitic garnet inclusions in diamonds were uh, calcium poor and uh, chrome rich Harzbergitic uh, pyropes. And that's what uh, this field represents. This line here is the diamond graphite stability uh, line, and it was developed by Gruder and Sweeney in 2000. So anything falling above that line is considered uh, within, uh, to be within the diamond stability field. Um, down here in the G5 box, um, these tend to be low to moderate chrome uh, garnets. They tend to have uh, bit more enrichment in sodium and titanium. And then these over here in the G1 tend to be part of the low chrome suite 
of, of garnets. And these here are the equigitic garnets down here that plot along the bottom. Um, so what we'll do is we'll look at each um, graph uh, plotted separately with their own data points. So here we have the, the Paradis Pond uh, data set. And you can see a nice cluster of points plotting within the G9 field. Again, common, uh, common to see in, in most kimberlites. But what's interesting is this, is this nice cluster of, of G10s here. Um, and a, a nice array of points falling above that, that uh, diamond stability line, uh, falling in that G10 diamond stability field. There's some points in here in the G5 also, some eclogitic points along the bottom, which we have plotted on other graphs. Some of them have a, a slightly elevated chrome content. And the one thing that stands out on this graph for sure are these three points here to the right. Um, these are mantle-derived garnets with elevated calcium and chrome. And these tend to, uh, tend to occur in xenolithic fragments. So it's good to see this cluster of points too. Now for the sample PP2009, um, again, we see a cluster of points in the G9 field. But if we compare it to this one on the left, um, you can see that these points here have shifted a bit to the right. And that might imply that a different part of the mantle was sampled, um, or this could be another phase of the kimberlite. So there's a couple of different explanations you can use for that shift. But you can see that they've moved more towards a slightly higher calcium component. And then again, some nice points here in the G10 field and a, a standalone point up here, um, well above the diamond stability field, uh, st stability line. Um, approaching 12 weight percent CR203. Now for the um, PP200304 sample, um, again, a cluster of, of points in the G9 field. You can see that the line has a bit more of a diagonal trend to it, again, suggesting possibly um, a different part of the mantle uh, sampled or perhaps some sort of metasomatic reactions which have caused a, a different uh, mineral chemical signature in these garnets. Some more points here in the G10 field, which is great to see. And points down here in the, in the equigitic garnet field. The Con uh, sample uh, data set, again, cluster of points in the G9 field, common to see in, in, in many of the global kimberlites and common to see in, in a lot of the exploration programs. But not so common are these G10. And it, it's great to see these, these clusters of G10 garnets in these, these sample suites. Um, a cluster of three points up here, which may represent um, uh, a cluster of garnets from the same mantle nodule type thing that have similar chemistries. Now, um, the echogenic garnets were, were plotted in terms of, of calcium titanium. And it's, uh, what you want to see is this increasing trend to, uh, of titanium in these, in these uh, echogenic garnets. Uh, it shows elevated titanium indicative of, of kind of elevated pressures, um, substitution implying a deeper mantle source for these echogenic garnets. This graph here um, represents a uh, calcium sodium plot. This is of the Paradis Pond. And first thing we notice is this horizontal line, which cuts across the graph at 0 0.07 weight percent sodium. And um, it's believed that anything falling above this horizontal line defines a more prospective eclogitic garnet composition. Um, and these eclogitic nodules are, are possibly uh, diamond perspective. So these are great to see these elevated sodium contents. Now, when we look at the chromite graphs, um, we'll look at Paradis Pond first. Uh, this is a titanium versus chrome plot. 
And again, various fields here on this graph. Uh, the most important being this diamond inclusion field up here. And then in here we have the overlap field and then field unique to kimberlites and lamproites and um, the non-kimberlite field down here. So with this RJK data, you can see um, a lot of points within this overlap field. And a lot of the points are, are uh, elevated in chrome and a really nice uh, diamond inclusion chromite up here and a cluster of points here in this, this unique field to kimberlites and lamproites. So it's good to see these, these points. And then these two down here might be derived from a more crustal source. Now the con graph is a little bit different. Um, it tends to show this horizontal uh, trend of the data points. Um, I don't particularly have um, an explanation for this other than this might represent um, a core to rim zoning of, of the chromites. So this might represent a, a deeper mantle source and these might represent the, the rinds or the rims on those grains as they ascended through uh, the mantle into the crust. These might be reaction rims. We'll have a quick look at the ilmenite graphs. Um, first of all, the ilmenite graphs are plotted in terms of magnesium titanium. Um, there's two parabolic lines here, or arc-shaped lines that are represented on this graph. This top line here, which intersects uh, the x-axis at lower magnesium contents. Um, this line implies uh, lower magnesium contents representing the boundary uh, between uh, more kimberlitic ilmenites to the right and non-kimberlitic sources to the left. And this other line, the second line here, uh, is the bounding reference line of kimberlitic ilmenite composition. So anything falling to the right of this line is considered uh, perspective. So we notice a bunch of points over here to the far left, possibly a, a crustal source, maybe from a dike or something like that. Whereas these here are plotting within the Kimberlite field. The same points uh, are often plotted on uh, a magnesium chrome plot. And um, what's interesting about the magnesium chrome plot is that um, Haggerty in 1991 defined a parabolic shape to this graph um, in which points on, on the, the left side of the parabola would be uh, less perspective for diamonds as opposed to the, the right side of the parabola, which would be more diamond perspective. And looking at uh, the RJK points here from Paradis Pond, there's definitely a, a trend here on the right side of that parabola. And these points down here are those uh, crustal uh, ilmenites. So looking at the, the con uh, graphs, again, those two arcuate lines, it's one point here falling to the left in the, the non-kimberlitic field, whereas these points here are plotting to the right uh, within the kimberlite field with elevated magnesium and titanium and falling uh, within the diamond uh, stability field of this graph. Now looking at the magnesium chrome plot of that same graph and thinking about that parabola, again, nothing happening on that left side of the parabola, but we definitely have some grains here forming that right side of the parabola, which is the, the side that you want to, uh, you want to see your grains on. In terms of the clinopyroxene graphs, um, clinopyroxene data is generally plotted on a sodium uh, versus chrome plot. Um, some points, as you know it here, are plotted close to the, the x-axis and uh, the chrome diopsides, uh, they define, you can see a, a linear uh, cluster or trend um, with increasing sodium and increasing chrome. Um, and this trend to increasing sodium and chrome defines an increasing substitution of the ureite molecule 
within the diopside ophocyte structure of the clinopyroxene. And that substitution is considered to be a function of increasing pressure, suggesting derivation of these grains from a deeper mantle source um, in the diamond bearing uh, stability field. So it's great to see these elevated sodium and elevated chrome grains. Um, just looking at some of the points on these on this graph, you can see that they some of them form these pairs. Um, one possible interpretation here is that again, this might be quarter rim zoning, so a more uh, sodium rich uh, core, and then maybe a, a reaction rim or, or some something like that forming the the rind. So again, a core and a rim, possibly, and a core and a rim. Um, in terms of the, the con uh, sample suite, again, um, not no points down here on that x-axis, and they're all forming that, that nice trend of increasing sodium, increasing chrome, and you know some pretty spectacular uh, sodium chrome compositions with like two and a half percent. Uh, sodium and you know three and a half percent chrome. So if we consider the RJK data data suite and and we think about other um, diamond mines and and just globally uh, some thoughts on on, on mineral chemistry, um, we'll start here with this. Uh, this plot from the Victor mine. Here's the, the reference for the paper, if you're interested. Um, interestingly, uh, they have uh, eclogitic garnets along the bottom, which RJK also has. Uh, they have the points falling within the Lurs light field, which RJK has. Um, the one thing this graph does not have is the points within the G10 field, uh, which RJK does have. And it's, it's great to see the the indicators within that G10 field. Um, Victor also has some pretty extraordinary compositions of garnets with very high calcium and extremely high uh, chrome contents. Um, these tend to be uh, green garnets and that sort of thing, um, which stand out from the, the, the dark purple garnets you're used to seeing in the G10 field. Here's a, a graph from uh, South Africa, from the Karawi uh, diamond mine. Um, here's our calcium chrome plot again. And you can see a nice cluster of eclogitic garnet points along the bottom, um, some with uh, a bit of chrome in them. And then not so much in the, the Lurzelite component, but they do have quite a number in the, the Harzburgitic component. And here's that um, a diamond graphite stability field line and you can see a lot of data points falling along or above that line and one extraordinary point up here around over 14 weight percent chrome subcalcic garnet uh, you know falling on the seven gigapascal line which is incredibly deep so uh, the RJK grains, if you think back to the calcium chrome plots, have points within the Lurzelite trend, and they also have a whole lot of points in this Harzburgitic uh, G10 field, sharing some some similarities to uh, to this particular mine. And then, in a, a global context, um, global data set of garnet inclusions within diamonds. So you can see that uh, in terms of the, the Lurzelite uh, garnets, there are not many uh, G9s that occur as inclusions within diamonds. The majority of the population of, of, of garnets within diamonds are G10s. And uh, RJK has quite a number of G10s, which is very encouraging. In terms of Summary, um, you know, the RJK kimberlite has very interesting mineral chemistry. It's comparable to a number of different mines uh, in the world. 
and as many similarities to uh, this global uh, database of, of garnet inclusions and diamonds. They have great looking CPXs. They're, they have some diamond inclusion chromites. Um, their ilmenites look great. And um, I think it's definitely a project to be excited about and with a, a lot of upside potential and for positive news. So really looking forward to uh, continuing to work with RJK. Well, this has been extremely informative and I appreciate you taking the time to kind of go over this with us. So we'll get this out to, to people and maybe they'll have a better understanding of what's going on with RJK. So thank you very much, Jim. I appreciate your time. Well, thank you very much. Take care.